Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Katherine Kraft, clinical psychologist. This is the ninth in our series of videos looking at anxiety in the time of COVID-19. Of course, the principles and strategies that I talk about are applicable to anxiety at all times. This video is particularly for parents, teachers, but also for everyone who has ever been a child. Looking at how we handle the topic of emotions in children is important because it is in our childhood that we learn the emotional patterns that we will continue in our lifetime. The source of the material I'm presenting in these videos is not from any book. I had to write the books to see my own work in writing. What I am covering is material that I have learned directly from people. First from the young people, the children that I taught, starting with teaching second graders, and then up to teaching teens. Information that I've learned from being a psychologist and working with people of all ages. Information from being a parent. So it's people who have taught me this information. And what I'm presenting to you about children, this is what children have taught me about how they are. The first thing that children have taught me about how they are is that they are naturally emotionally open. Children are naturally very close to their emotions. They know that they're feeling when they are feeling. They may or may not know what they are feeling, depending on what they have learned up to that point, but they certainly do know that they're feeling something. This tells me that being emotionally open is the natural way for us as human beings. We have to learn to make ourselves be emotionally closed and in denial about our emotions, repressing our emotions, rejecting our emotions, shoving them away, displacing them, projecting them onto others. We have to learn to do all of that. If you just look at the young child, you'll see that they are very honest with their emotions. That is, they are, until we teach them to be otherwise. So emotional intelligence means the ability that every human being has to be emotionally open, to know our emotions, to accept our emotions, to express our emotions in healthy ways. For children, I use the tool, the ABCs of emotion management, or the ABCs of emotions. A means accepting and allowing your emotions. Allow the child to have feelings. B, we know already a little bit about this, B is to be with the emotion, to breathe through the emotion to remember to do your diaphragmatic breathing and to teach that to children, which we'll cover in this video. The C of the ABCs is to channel the emotion, to constructively channel the emotion in some positive way, instead of some way that is negative or harmful to self or harmful to others. That's the ABCs of emotions. Now it's impossible in one video to cover techniques, strategies, approaches that zero in on each and every age level or each grade in school. So instead, I'm going to cover two major principles of emotional development that apply to all age groups. The first of those uh, core concepts, and we have a panel that we'll put up about that, uh, the first is, all emotion is okay, some behavior is not okay. This is very different from what many of us grew up with. Many of us who are adults grew up with the message that your emotion is not okay. And certainly some of the spontaneous behaviors that you engage in are not okay. This is not emotional intelligence. All emotion is okay. There's no such thing as, well, but you shouldn't feel that way. No, if a person feels that way, then that's the way they feel. 
What matters is not just that we accept their feelings, but that we're very clear that the only behavior we accept with the emotion is the behavior that is indeed a positive behavior in some way, in some way an acceptable behavior. So for all age groups, a key message is, I accept your feelings, but I cannot accept your behavior. If the behavior is unacceptable, it's unacceptable, and we cannot accept it. But I still accept and value the emotions that you have inside of yourself that may be behind the behavior. This principle applies to all age groups. In the field of education, we talk about teachable moments. A teachable moment is a special point in time in which something the child is doing or saying or not doing or not saying is an opportunity for us to teach the child something very important. In that sense, a child's entire childhood and adolescence is nothing but a very long series of teachable moments about human emotions. When we look at these opportunities and see them as opportunities to teach something critically important to the child, not only will our own adult stress level go down, but we can take something which on the surface appears to be very negative and turn it into something positive. So let's take the example of the two-year-old temper tantrum. And remember, although I'm talking about two years old, the principle behind this applies to all age groups, including teenagers, to ourselves too, as adults. So let's say we have a two-year-old boy who we'll call Bobby. And Bobby loves to play with his trucks. But he has this one toy truck. It's one of his favorites. But he uses that truck, plays with it so much, that one of the wheels on that truck is now slightly broken, gets loose and comes off often. So he's playing and you're sitting over playing at your video games and the wheel comes out and he yells, ah! And you turn and you look and you get up and go down and pick up the truck, pick up the wheel, put the wheel back on and go back to what you're doing. You do it lickety-split, one, two, three. Later, that same day or the next day, Bobby's playing with his truck and the wheel comes off again. So his first move is to attempt to imitate what he saw you do. He picks up the wheel, he picks up the truck, he tries to go screw, 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 screw it on, and it doesn't work. His little hands do not have the eye-hand coordination that he is in the process of developing, but he doesn't have it at two years old. He's still working on that eye-hand coordination thing. So in frustration, when he can't succeed in putting the wheel back on the truck, he throws the, wheel the, the, throws the wheel and the truck across the room and screams. Now, whether you hear the wail and come to see what's going on, or whether you see the child do it, this is a teachable moment. So first, let's say what not to do. What may have happened to you when you were a child and you threw something across the room. Because what used to happen is the adults would say, Stop! Don't do that! You're being naughty! You're going to break it worse! You, somebody could get hurt! We give little children, who have not yet reached the age of reason, we give little children all kinds of rational reasons why they should or should not do something, not realizing that their brains are not developed enough to comprehend fully what we are saying. What the child gets from, don't do that, you're being bad, you're being naughty, I'm going to put you in time out, I'm going to swat you on the butt, stop that. What the child learns is to be afraid of his or her own emotion, his or her own frustration and anger at having to deal with a truck that he can't fix at the age of two. So that approach, quite simply, does not raise emotionally intelligent children. The teachable moment that this example provides is 
to go over to the child. Yes, you the adult, you have to stop what you're doing, especially the first time this happens, go over to the child, get down on the child's eye level, and say to the child, I see that you are angry, but no matter how angry you ever get, you may not throw your truck across the room. You will see when you do that, that children calm down. The, the teaching that you have given is, in that moment, you have connected the behavior of the frustration and the anger with the word angry, and you have let the child know, I see, if, if you were in the other room and you only heard the child scream and the sound of the truck hitting the wall, you can say, I hear that you were very angry. But, so we accept the emotion. That part of the directive is accepting the emotion. But we go on, we don't stop there. We say, however, no matter how mad you are, you may not throw your truck across the room. When the child calms down, then you can give one or two rational reasons. Somebody could be coming around the corner and you could accidentally hit them with the uh, truck. Only when the child calms down do we try to give further explanations. Now, as adults, we know this feeling. If you've ever been working on the computer and trying to do something that has many steps to it, even if somebody has shown you how to do it, or you have instructions on how to do it, it's click here, then click there, then click here, then click there, then click, 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 click here, click there, and you do it, and it doesn't work. So you do it again, and it doesn't work. You turn the computer off and you turn it back on and you do it again and it still doesn't work. Well, after doing it for the sixth time, what do you feel like throwing? We know these emotions. The emotion is okay. As adults, we have learned, most of us have learned, that throwing something across the room is not the solution for it. So, looking at a child's development, as an ongoing series of teachable moments about human emotions in which the core message is the same over and over and over again. I accept your emotion. What you have done with that emotion is unacceptable. Let's talk about and let's learn some okay things to do with your emotion. In, in my books on, on emotional development, on emotional intelligence, I get specific about the kinds of things that we can teach uh, children to do uh, with their emotions. Particularly as my work uh, uh, right now is geared towards older children, how we can help older children with their emotions. Raising an emotionally open child, as we discover these and use these teachable moments, Let's go back to the two-year-old. After the child is calm, as the child is calming down, you hug the child, you let the child know that you accept the emotion, but not the behavior. Then, this is also a teachable moment, to teach the child belly breathing. We call it, for adults, diaphragmatic breathing. But in working with children, I've learned that children just adore calling it belly breathing. If you use the word tummy in your family, you could call it tummy breathing. Teach belly breathing to even very young children. Young children, say younger than nine, they love the concept and they love to see their adults teach it to them with exaggeration. So get up in front of the child, show the child, this is when the child is calm, Show the child how to do belly breathing by using a lot of silly exaggeration. Uh, pooch out your stomach, lean back slightly, make it look like you have a really big belly. Go ahead and breathe in with dramatic sounds, sniffing and breathe out, exhale loudly. Use silliness, use drama, use sound effects as you teach your young child how to do belly breathing. Then, step by step, get more and more serious as you breathe with the child. You show the child what to do first, and then you ask the child, okay, now do it with me. 
Breathe with me. Breathe this belly breath with me. And you make it very clear to the child, this is what I want you to do when you're very scared, when you're very angry, when you're very emotional. You can even show a young child. Really, I've found through the years that children get all this, they understand all this much faster than we adults do. So you can even, with more drama, show a child, okay, here is you. Now, you know your child, or if you're a teacher, the children in your classroom. So you imitate them, say, here is you being scared. Now watch my face. So that's what you look like when you're scared. But did you notice something? When I look like that, I'm not breathing. So you can help even a young child understand the reason to launch themselves into belly breathing is because when they're scared, they're not realizing it, but holding their breath, or if they're breathing, they're breathing shallow breaths. We need to oxygenate the blood so that we oxygenate the brain so that we calm ourselves down. Even a young child, one and a half, two years old, can learn to do this. If the adults with that child teach these things to the child. As the child grows older, the same principles apply, and we can use some of the same techniques, but our approaches have to be in accordance with whatever age level the child is, whatever grade level the child is on. With teenagers, we can pretty much expect the same results and the same input that we get from adults. When you have not lived a certain way, when you have not respected and honored your emotions, when you've spent a good chunk of your life trying to push your emotions away, it is very difficult to apply these principles at first. And teenagers are going to be very open about that. They're going to say, oh, that's silly. Oh, that can't work. Oh, it's not that easy. And they're right. It's not easy to handle our emotions in a constructive way when we've grown up not doing that. But if you have the opportunity to start with a very young child and teach that child the principles of emotional intelligence from the time that child is one, one and a half, two, you will raise a totally different kind of human being. Teenagers do need to know and understand that we are with them. This is hard for them, yes, it's hard for us too. Life is hard. Living in the time of a pandemic is hard. It's not easy. We can agree with our teenagers. Yes, you're right. Learning to do these things to manage your emotions is not easy. The second core concept that applies to all age groups is to use self-talk. It is natural for us to understand that as our baby grows into a toddler, we're constantly teaching them language. We show them something and we say the name of it and we want the little baby, the one, one and a half, two year old to say the word back to us, to talk to us. This process of using words to express ourselves continues our whole life. So for older children, the directive is, use your words. If you have a teenager who's moping around the house, giving you all kinds of external signs that they're feeling something, you can say to them, tell me with words how you're feeling. You know what I mean. Not the usual teenage Ugh! type of response. You can be even stronger by saying, I can see your face, I hear your sighs, I want to know what you're feeling. I want to know. Tell me with words what you're feeling. I'll make it easy for you. Here are three emotions that give most people the most trouble most of the time. Fear, anger, sadness. Tell me, my child, are you scared? Are you sad? Are you mad? Multiple choice, pick one. And you don't let go of the team, you know. You're right in front of them. 
You don't get out of their face until they give you an answer. You made it fall over backward easy for them. It's not their fault that they find it so hard to express their emotions for us. We, our entire culture works against feeling the feeling world. We, we just, we, we've rejected it for eons. I'll, I'll tell you a personal story, which is the absolute truth. When I was seven, about seven, I fell off my bike, ran in the, in the house crying. My mother was busy. I kept crying. And she said to me, if you keep crying like that, I'm going to call the men in white coats to come get you. Yeah, I'll bet you had something similar to that happen to you. Is any wonder I became a psychologist? This is ridiculous, telling children these things. Emotions are normal. Emotions are natural. Emotions are human. Telling little children in any way, or telling teenagers in any way, that we reject their uh, emotions, well, that is what has brought us to the world we have today. If we want a different kind of world, we have to change how we're raising children in terms of the emotional development of the child. So the videos I've done in this series that talk about, well, that talk about self-talk, that's for teenagers and older children, as well as for adults. No, it's not easy, but it works if you do it. In AA, they have a wonderful saying. They have many wonderful sayings, but the one here that I'm referencing is the one that says, the program works if you work the program. Well, all of these principles, all of these strategies that we're covering in these videos, they work if you do them, if you practice them over and over and over. And most particularly, practice when you don't need it. So for example, with the diaphragmatic breathing, you practice that when you're okay, when you're relatively calm, when you don't need it. That's when you practice. So that when you do, as people love to use the words, get upset, when you do feel emotion, you can spring right into diaphragmatic breathing because the pattern for doing that, you've already put it in your brain and you've already made a decision for yourself, okay, when I feel highly emotional, this is one of the things I'm gonna do right away to help myself. In our culture, we value greatly independence. America fought a war that we call the war for independence. And we have many types of independence that adults have achieved. I certainly hope that you have achieved some level of personal independence in terms of choosing a line of work you like, choosing a life partner, or not choosing a life partner as you choose, and that you have the independence that financial security affords. Yes, I know that's an issue in this, these days of pandemic. But we know, acknowledge, and accept all those kinds of independence. What we speak very little about is emotional independence. Learning how to take care of our own emotions. To self-soothe ourselves by knowing how to do belly breathing, by knowing how to locate and change our self-talk, by when, when the emotion is really, really intense, crying, by learning how to cry in a safe and secure way, as we've talked about. Learning all of these skills and more build emotional independence so that even when life throws us some very, very rough issues to deal with, we can still uh, deal with our emotions in a healthy way. Since this video is for teachers as well as for parents, I, I want to say a few words about the books uh, that I've published that are on this uh, subject. Uh, because there are uh, elements that may be confusing if you go online and you look for my books. The current book that I've already referenced is Emotional Intelligence in Schools, a Comprehensive Approach to Developing Emotional Literacy. Um, 
This is a 2020 book. This is a book for high school counselors and teachers, health teachers, school psychologists, but really for all teachers. Having been a teacher, I know that one of the things that teachers most abhor is the concept of, oh my God, another thing they want us to teach. I understand. This is not that. In my book, I show you, your school system, your school principal, you a teacher, how to incorporate the principles of emotional intelligence into what you are already teaching. When you do this, I, I have words for coaches too, when you do this, you will be raising an emotionally intelligent, emotionally independent child. Now, when you search the internet, and please do search, because you will find a vast array of different prices that the book is being sold for, and I certainly do urge you to keep looking until you find what you're looking for in terms of price. And you'll also find uh, my other book, this book. Now this book, Effective Self-Esteem, was published in 1993. That's right, 27 years ago and they're still publishing it. The two books have basically the same material, the, the root of, of the material is the same. However, the current book is very, very different. I've updated the material. I mean, after all, my brain wasn't going to freeze in 1993. 27 years later, there's a lot more information I have and a lot more that I can tell you. But I know that school teachers love worksheets. I know I did when I was teaching. So the, the smaller book, the current book, has the worksheets in it, but you're going to have to photocopy it on a photocopy machine that will scale the size up to 8 by 11 to use it directly with your kids. If you want to just be able to photocopy the worksheets directly from the book, then the 1993 version is still available. The worksheets are not exactly the same, not at all. The, the crooks of them is very similar. You'll have to decide for yourself, but if you want to just be able to photocopy and then right away have sheets that you can hand out with whatever group you're working with, uh, and remember that these, this material is helpful not only for kids, but for any type of group situation in which people are learning about human emotions and learning how to handle their human emotions. So, at the end of the video, we'll show these again and I'll show you one page as an example of uh, a worksheet that you can just put on the photocopy machine and copy from the book Effective Self-Esteem. I, I wrote Effective Self-Esteem at the end of the 80s and self-esteem was the whole, the whole shebang. Yeah, that's, that's the way these kinds of realities were thought about back then. And affective, of course, means of or pertaining to emotions. So emotional intelligence, which is the current term, is the exact same thing. It's the exact same concepts, but it just expressed in different ways. Now, I want you to know that because uh, teachers, you are the ones, all teachers, not just the health teacher, you are the ones who can look at the material you are already teaching and craft it and shape it in such a way that you are going to be using what you're already teaching to teach the principles of emotional intelligence as well. Uh, any classroom teacher, your kid comes in upset one day, I mean, can you imagine what, how different things would be if you just said, okay, start breathing. Not, oh, what are you upset about? What's upset you? No, okay, I see that you're upset. Have you done your breathing? Let's breathe together. Before a test, you've got kids that are anxious because they have to do the test. All right, how about as a class? Everybody breathe in, hold the breath, belly breath, breathe out, do it again. Okay, now start your test. You can incorporate these principles directly into what you are already doing.
We have one more video in our series. The tenth video will take a look at all of these principles, but from yet another perspective. So far, we have looked at three levels of our humanity in these videos. We've looked at the physical level, certainly belly breathing, that's physical, crying, actually weeping, that's a physical thing. And of course, we have looked at the emotions, the emotional level, because that's the core of what we are talking about, the focus of what we're talking about. And we have brought in the mental level when we talked about self-talk. So, so far we have looked at our emotions from the physical, emotional, and mental level. There's one more level. That level is the higher mental. It's a level that through the ages, many people have noticed. And they've given it the name spiritual. But really, this has absolutely nothing to do with religion. This has to do with the higher level of our thinking capacities, our best selves as human beings, our whole selves as human beings. And in these difficult times, we certainly need to embrace our full humanity, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, to help ourselves with our anxiety in a time of pandemic. In this time, do know that heaven is with us, and may your angels bless you.